Hey guys, welcome back to the show. We are super excited to have Dr. Joan Rosenberg. She is a psychologist, PhD, and she's going to talk to us all things around confidence. And actually within 90 seconds, you can have more confidence and achieve more and live the life that you love. Huge call, but wait till you listen to the interview. It's incredible information and absolutely life-changing. All right, let's dive straight in. Dr. Joan Rosenberg, thank you so much for making the time available to speak to us today. Um, we're so happy to have you on the show. I'm thrilled to be here. So just eager to have a conversation and just looking forward to this. So you have a TED Talk. Uh, you know, people love your books. It's such an important, important topic. And I'd love to know how you got started in this particular area around confidence and why people lack confidence. Well, the, the story starts with me as a, as a young thing. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was a sh shy, sensitive child and found it very difficult to feel like I fit in and belonged. Uh, not uncommon to many, but I learned that much later in life. At that point when I was experiencing it, I thought I was all alone with that. And it, certainly as I grew up, that continued. I was also bullied in my childhood and through adolescence. So I had that experience as, as part of the uh, kind of part of the whole thing. And what I struggled with and realized at that point is that I would look over at my peers and see them all engaging with each other and seemingly laughing and connected and confident. It's like, and I didn't experience any of that. So I think one of the first things that happened for me was, was really kind of raising that question for myself. Is like, I want what they have. How do I get that? And, and cause standing next to them, it wasn't happening through osmosis. So I, it's like, I, I had to figure out something. And then as I got into my professional life, I had a other question that kind of surfaced, and that was what made it so difficult to, for people to experience unpleasant feelings. And again, this is a journey over decades now, but what I realized was that the answer to the second question about unpleasant feelings were, became actually the foundational answer to the first question about confidence. And so, so my early days and the, my early professional life kind of led me into the path. Excellent. So I'd love to know just as we yeah, just go back into that part of your story, what was, I guess, what was this definition of confidence that you came to understand and how was it different to what you thought it was before? Well, I, first of all, I, the big question for me is, it was like, how does somebody develop it? And, and I, you know, as much as I was in the field of doing therapy and as much as we know therapists tell people, well, you need confidence, there isn't a therapist that could tell me how to make that happen for somebody. And, and so it was like, is there a path? I mean, do you have to do certain things? Well, it's like, what do you do? And, and so what's ended up happening for me is, uh, and this is kind of one body of my work, but it's centered around one's capacity to experience and move through unpleasant feelings. And, and so the definition, my definition of confidence is tied to that. And, and what I understand about this is someone doesn't feel capable in life and feel like they can really handle life or do life until they have the sense of being able to handle unpleasant feelings. And I speak about eight in particular, but, but let me go with the definition of confidence as a starting point for us. And that is that for me, confidence is the deep sense that you can handle the emotional outcome of whatever you face or whatever you pursue. And that's the foundational piece. It's not the only thing, but for me, it's like, that's the, what I want to build everything else on. Oh, where were you years ago, Dr. Joan? <laughs> I, um, Matt and I, um, I think for a lot of people that know me now would have no idea that confidence has been the biggest hurdle for me. Matt and I used to joke, um, like I'm a musician and, uh, we used to joke that my, if I, if I had a theater production about my life, my, my opening song would be, if I only had some confidence, all the things <laughs> that I would do, if I only had some confidence. And like, like literally years ago, I, I really felt like it was the biggest barrier for myself. But I, so that leads to me to my next question for sure. people with low confidence. Is it, what is causing it? Uh, is it, is it like a personality thing? Is it a, uh, lack of self-worth what is happening there 
No, for me, the lack, the notion of a lack of self-esteem and a lack of self-worth are, I would hear that as harsh self-criticism. And so if I, if I look at it, I mean, I can hear certain people speak and I know right away kind of where they are. So, so somebody who describes a lot of anxiety, uh, I can tell you that they're not probably not allowing themselves to experience nor express unpleasant feelings. If somebody uh, has a hard time speaking up with other people, same issue. The, b- both, actually both, in, in fact. If uh, a low confidence in, individual tends to not want to ask for help, uh, feels like a burden, is engaged in harsh self-criticism, doesn't allow themselves to experience compliments, there's a, an array of things at play that once all of those things get addressed, it, it's like game-changing. Wow. I'm assuming if we could like sell this as a pill (laughs) and give people confidence, it would change the world. Um, So I'm very curious. Um, Obviously there's no magic pill, but there are like, you know, from your book, there's actually some very fast ways that we can achieve this confidence. So I'd love to hear the breakdown of how you can do that quickly. Cause I think uh, in your book, it was uh, 90 seconds. Um, <laughs> like within 90 seconds, we can like achieve this. So I'd, li- I'd love to hear the breakdown of how we well, can so, do this so, so quickly. Let's, so let's use the 90 seconds. The, so um, let's under, let's break two things apart. The, the 90 seconds is the method. I mean, the book title is 90 seconds to a life you love, but the, the subtitle is really where it's, it, that's the super important part of where the action is. And the subtitle is how to, how to master your difficult feelings to cultivate lasting confidence, resilience, and authenticity. So it's actually the handling of these eight feelings that for me is the magic. But, but the 90 seconds piece is super important too. So what, again, in answering the question about what made it so difficult for people to experience unpleasant feelings, it, it's, the, it's the 90 seconds piece that answers that. But it's only the method. And, and the idea here is that most of us come to know what we're feeling through bodily sensation. So the first thing to understand is that we're one interconnected whole. Um, We think of our brain as our body and our body as our brain. They're they're not separate. And so the first thing we've got to understand is that we're that one interconnected whole. The second thing is that most of us come to know what we're feeling emotionally through bodily sensation. So the easiest is to think about embarrassment. So there's, so for someone who is experiencing it, you're experiencing the heat here kind of at the chest and then it goes into the neck and then into the face. Somebody looking at you might see the redness, but you're feeling the heat, right? So the heat is the kind of the marker for you, if you will. And then for different feelings, we have different ways of experiencing them. So someone might experience anger with heat at the back of the neck. Somebody else might have it at the forearm. Somebody else might clench their jaw, right? So we can go on and on with a variety of feelings. But the, the other was an observation that was made by Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, who wrote the book, My Stroke of Insight. So I want to give attribution where attribution belongs. And she said that when a feeling gets triggered, there's a rush of biochemicals into our bloodstream that activate bodily sensations, the ones we're just talking about, and that those same biochemicals flush out of our bloodstream in roughly 90 seconds. So what I realized at that point, and two super important realizations, was one, that, that it's not that we don't want to feel the whole range of what we feel emotionally. I think we do because it's our sense of aliveness, right? And it's the thing that actually allows us to connect deeply with another human being, or maybe even to, to connect deeply to creative processes. So it's super important. It, it, but what I realized is that it's that we don't want to feel the bodily sensation that helps us know what we're feeling. That's what's so doggone uncomfortable. And that's what everybody wants to distract and get away from. So that if I could help somebody understand that in order to lean into unpleasant feelings, all it took for them was to like a surfer on, on waves was to surf uh, the uh, surf or ride these bodily waves of sensations and that they were short lived, then that they could lean into it. And most people will go, well, I can do 90 seconds. So the key here and my, kind of the whole premise of the book is that if, if you can ride one or more short lived bodily sensation waves, so key is one or more, it's the more is in there too. 
and of one or more of eight unpleasant feelings, you can go pursue whatever you want in life. That's a profound. Uh, so taking someone that's, I guess, watching this right now, that's just like, okay, I'm ready. It's 90 seconds. Give me this 90 seconds of power. It's what I've been missing my whole life. Uh, what's the, if you're going to practically take someone through that, uh, where do you start? I, you know what? I'll give you a great example from something that happened two hours ago. Great. And, and I was talking to a male client and he was talking about diff, some difficult conversations with both of his children. And, and I can see his lip quivering, right? Doesn't want to, doesn't want to feel what's going on. And earlier we were talking about how he, how he makes efforts to kind of shut down on the experience. So I, so I said, well, what were you feeling in those situations when you, you know, whatever happened a week or two ago? And, and so he started to give me all sorts of words that sounded like, uh, I'm, I wish actually don't, uh, something about being taken for dead or um, he was invisible. That's actually, those aren't feeling words. I said, well, those are some of what I'm hearing is actually self-criticism. What was the, what were the feelings? So then we got to sad and disappointed and angry and but as soon as he starts to say the word, I know he has to experience it. So now he's in the experience of it, and now I can see again. There's more redness. There's more quivering, and he's tearful. So now it's now let's breathe. Just breathe. Just let let the breath carry the waves of feeling. So think of the breath sort of as the surfboard. And you're the feeling riding on top of that surfboard, right? And so you're just going to, you're going to ride the way. And so all I did was just encourage him to keep breathing and to stay present to the feeling and just let it move through him. And then we could talk about what happened after that. So that's, that's as simple as it is. It's think of it almost as the equivalent of, of hitting your elbow, like hitting your funny bone on your elbow or stubbing your toe. It doesn't last a long time. It's a little uncomfortable when you're first experiencing it, but it doesn't last a long time. And you ride this pain sensation until it abates. Well, I'm talking about the same thing, really, with emotional feelings that feel unpleasant to us. I think that's such a powerful uh, modality of dealing, I think, just with not with just confidence, I think with general mindfulness, right? Like, for example, right. when we fear, we, we fear something, it's more the fear of the emotion itself that's worse than, worse than the actual emotion. So allowing it to pass over you or watch for me, I've used like the cloud go by um, when dealing with certain anxieties in my life. I feel that's really helped. So it's really cool to see that this is a really effective modality to treat um, specifically confidence. So right. what what is the like there is time. I think I think it's more rare, obviously, unfortunately, but there are times when we are in this state of, you know, enhance self-confidence, we feel powerful, we feel strong. What are right. the benefits of living in this state versus not living in this state? Um, is well, that sort for of me, well, again, and I, I would make distinctions there with you around what looks like arrogance uh, and, and looks like someone who, who's conceited and has so much confidence is actually the opposite of what you're, you're actually seeing the opposite. Right. Uh, okay. So, right. So, so genuine confidence, what you experience typically with people is uh, a pretty content moods, probably a sense of optimism. There's no need to brag about oneself. One tells one's truth. So if I looked at you, for instance, and said, you know, are you a good musician? And you told me, yes, you were. Right. Then that would be that would be super healthy. But if you had to tell me 17 times, it probably wasn't true. Right. <laughs> right. But so a couple times to just express the truth of who you are and own it, um, that would be that would be what confidence looks like. And there's a sense of inner peace. So it's kind of contentment and inner peace that comes along with it. And then you have the sense that you can go pursue whatever you want. So what's the difference there for children, say like yourself and myself, that somehow as children we're very shy, non not confident, and then other children that just are confident. What what is the difference there if if it's not a personality thing? You know, well, there's temperament that's at play, but I I have to tell you that in some ways I felt like a, it seems so simple in some ways, but I I think when I was around 30 or 31, um, which was like yesterday, I think, but um, <laughs> the <laughs> that that the 
what I realized is that shyness was wanting someone else to be vulnerable first. Mm. Is not wanting to put myself out there and, and, and have the other, in this case, the, the other seven feelings that I talk about. So let me talk about the feelings first, because it'll put it in context. Yeah, and, yes. and I actually think that that's some of what that beyond temperament, kind of natural temperament, biological, if you will, and the contribution that our life history has on us. I, I do also think that there's part of what's at play is this choice to pull back as opposed to move forward. And so what I talk about are eight key feelings, our feeling states, and they are sadness, shame, helplessness, anger, vulnerability, embarrassment, disappointment, and frustration. Now, the key here, and the secret key to the whole thing, is that if you can handle one or more of those other seven feelings, you can choose into being vulnerable all the time which means you can choose into pursuing whatever you want all the time because you know that the emotional outcome is going to be one or more of those other seven feelings. So that, so that, it, cause I make it, and this notion of vulnerability is the sense that I could be hurt. So what's hurt going to look like the other seven feelings. So why, why would I not put myself, if we go the shyness route, why would not I put myself out there and say, Hey, you know, Jill, would you come over and play with me today? Because I didn't want to be disappointed. So I'll just back off and I won't make the I won't lean in and make the ask. But we're at our greatest strength when we choose vulnerability. Wow. That's beautiful. Then we can choose vulnerability when we know we can handle the other seven feelings. I love that. Great. I'm curious as to what you think as well about <laughs> is this something we can obviously develop? Um, and I'm guessing with some of the, the, the system that you use and what you use with clients, it's sort of it's something that builds up over time because we don't obviously can't go from zero to all of a sudden I'm confident. Right. Um, is it sort of like, you know, going to the gym and practicing a muscle group almost like just, uh, really yes, yes. So let me, let me dig into the, probably the four to six most important things that I think need to have happen for somebody. And most people have them backwards that we think that. Uh, so, so the foundational piece is being able to experience and move through those eight unpleasant feelings. And you're not just going to do it once in life. It's whenever it shows up, right? So that's, that's from here forward for the rest of your life. And what I will find is when somebody starts to lean into those feelings uh, where they may, not have ha they may not have allowed themselves to do that before, they either became explosive and reactive or they were shutting down, but now they're leaning into them more effectively – that there's an organic lift to their sense of self because in, the, in most cases, now they're not avoiding. They're being more true to who they are. When we're more true to who we are, we get a natural lift. When we try to ignore, play down, or avoid who we are by, by shutting down, distracting, and again, there's, we can go through that long list of how all of us can distract, right? Drugs, alcohol, sex, pornography, social media, shopping, food, I mean, the list is endless, that, that when we stop avoiding and we move into awareness and stay present to what we're experiencing, allow ourselves to experience those eight unpleasant feelings, then we get an organic lift. The second is having to do with speaking. And, and my view on this is that if, if being able to experience those eight unpleasant feelings was not the foundation, speaking up would be. That, that's, how, that's how central and how important it is that I, I believe to our sense of well-being and our sense of confidence. But what's interesting here is, again, I think we have a lot of confusing ideas about it. It's the notion that I know myself and I'm confident and then I'll speak up. Except that's not the way it works. It actually works the other way. It's as I speak and through speaking, I actually come to know myself better. And that's how I develop confidence. So I actually have to do the speaking in order to feel the confidence. It's not that I'm confident and then I speak. And then this, the, and there's much more to say about speaking, too, because the, the idea here isn't that somebody actually speaks to get what they want. Ostensibly, that's they do. But that, for me, is the benefit. That's not the goal. Getting what they want is the benefit. In yeah. my mind, the real reason for someone to speak up is to grow them. It's to evolve them. 
So what would be an example of speaking up or a scenario where someone that's not confident wouldn't speak up? Uh, you name it. Um, I won't, I won't make a request at a, at a store, right? Uh, I won't turn to my partner and say, I love you. I won't turn to my date and say, I'd love to spend more time with you. Uh, I'm enjoying myself. Um, or I'm disappointed about something that happened and I'm not going to tell you about the disappointment or the anger or the whatever. So it's, it, or I won't go to my boss and ask for the raise that's long overdue or set boundaries and say, Hey, this is, this is you're asking too much of me right now. So it's the whole gamut from, from, I would say from conflict to intimacy. Um, and that you can name virtually any scenario in there. And the thing to understand here is that speaking up is not, difficulty speaking up is not a speaking problem. Difficulty speaking up is a difficulty with unpleasant feeling problem. So for someone that uh, wants to learn how to speak up, what's, could you just talk us through some sort of self-talk that someone could have in their mind? Like how do you get someone to uh, have enough impetus to actually get those words out? What I would say, what's the value of whatever it is they're trying to achieve? Do they want, do they want to be able to see the person again? Do they want the partner to know that they love them? Do they need to discuss uh, the boundary setting? What's the value of importance to that individual? So the, the impetus is, is attach yourself to the meaning of that. And, and the, the beauty of it is, is that I also know the moment someone starts to do that, their whole, self, their whole sense of self changes because now they feel like they are empowered in a way internally that they never had before. Now they have a way to protect themselves because speaking is our first line of defense. And, and they have a way to, it, for me, it's actually to go for limitless possibility or limitless opportunity. Because if I don't tell you that, that I want something or that I'm interested in something, you can't know to keep it in your mind that when you come across it to let me know. Right. So, so it, it, again, it's unbelievably liberating. And it, so the thing I would say is it, the only reason you're holding yourself back is because you don't want to feel the discomfort of your own emotional discomfort. Think eight unpleasant feelings or the discomfort of someone else's emotional discomfort. Think the same eight unpleasant feelings. And that's the only reason you're not speaking up. So can you say to yourself, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm going to go for what I want and I can handle the emotional outcome if I don't get it, mm. which is again, one or more of those eight unpleasant feelings. I love that. Could you repeat for us again, what those eight feelings are? Absolutely. Sadness, mm -hmm. shame, helplessness, anger, vulnerability, embarrassment, disappointment, and frustration. Yep. <laughs> and and so, so, so again, and why these eight? Because they're the most common everyday spontaneous reactions to things not turning out the way we perceive we need or the way we want. It's the everydayness of them. What is the connection between these eight states and anxiety? Because anxiety is something as well that you obviously speak a lot about. Is there a connection between those? In my mind, absolutely, yes. So, um, and, and there was some reference to it earlier. So the thing that I, uh, can, uh, can I play a little bit here? Would that be all right or no? Yeah. yeah go for okay. It. All right. So, so think about a situation. Don't, don't even bother to tell me what it is, but for maybe one or both of you, think about a situation that made you anxious and the anxiety stuck. You were, you just stayed in that state. Okay. Do you, you have one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't tell me. Now, if I took all the words for anxiety away from you, what would you really be feeling? Oh, that's hard. And, um, you can, and you can use one or more of the eight with, uh, to um, respond. I'd be uncomfortable. That, what, was, well, what was the discomfort? What was the feeling discomfort? I guess elevated heart rate or... No, 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 no. That's, that's bodily. What's, a, what's an emotional feeling? Attach emotional an emotional feeling, feeling to it. Use one or more of the eight. Were you vulnerable? Were you sad? Were you embarrassed? Were you angry? Yeah, embarrassment would be there. Embarrassment? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to guess embarrassment and vulnerability. Okay. Because mm -hmm. those two tend to go together very well. And did you also come up with an example? Yes. 
Okay. So it, what, is there, if I took the words uh, anxiety away from you, did you, did, was there a feeling there? Yeah. Um, I, I think, I don't know if you thought of a similar thing, but, um, uh, mine would be actually be the same. So there's, why were we thinking the same thing? That's not good for the example, but yes, I would okay. also be, so vulnerability and embarrassment. um, yes. Okay. All right. Now, um, was, did you allow yourself? To, so now go back to the situation and allow yourself to experience the vulnerability and embarrassment in the situation. So go take a few seconds, go back into the experience and now acknowledge the embarrassment and the vulnerability that you felt. Do you still feel anxious? No, 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 exactly. It's, it's almost like, <laughs> it's almost like it's, they're just like fleeting emotions. It, like it, right. Right. But you can feel the embarrassment, but the anxiety is not there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So the uh, second half of this is, was somebody else present in the situation? Yes. Okay. And did you express the embarrassment or the vulnerability that you felt in that situation to them? No. No. Wow. Very so, powerful exercise. What's that? It's a very powerful exercise. So, right. So, so for me, the thing is, is, and I don't like people, I think using the word fear and anxiety are both overused and misused. So I don't like people to use either uh, for different reasons, but anxiety for me is way too vague. If I asked 10 people what anxiety meant to them, I'd get 10 different answers. Mm. So it's way too vague. It's not, it's not helpful at all. But if I can get people to be specific, now they're into the specific experience and that tends to be calming. In fact, I, I almost kind of watch like it's like watching a nervous system or the balloon coming, the air coming out of the balloon. It's like, oof, it's like all of a sudden there's this settling down. Mm -hmm. And and so I tend to think first think that anxiety is a cover for the eight unpleasant feelings. All it is is a distraction. That's it. It's not it is a real thing. But in most cases, it's not right. It's if you start to use the real language, then the anxiety disappears. And and the second thing for me. If somebody describes themselves as anxious, I, I can almost bet, one, that they're not allowing themselves to access or experience and move through those eight unpleasant feelings, nor are they expressing them. So for, Mary, for me, anxiety is also unexperienced and unexpressed feeling. You know, you, you also asked a question, and I want to circle back because there's a, a couple other kind of big pieces uh, in terms of like kind of what goes into the confidence. The sec the Beyond speaking, so it's we have experiencing the, the feeling is the foundation. We have speaking up as a second really crucial part of it. A uh, third part of it is taking action. Same thing. It's like speaking. It's not that I'm confident and then I go take the risk or go take the action. It's that I take the action and then I get the benefit of being more confident. Why? Because I persevere. I deal with the frustrations and, and I keep going. Think of an athlete or, in this case, musician. You stay the course until you get it, right? And you're willing to deal with the frustrations, but then you become at least confident in a domain. But the, the reality is that we can cut that across all of it. And then the other two super important pieces to me are ending harsh self-criticism and taking in genuine compliments. That is weird, isn't it? Why can't we take in genuine compliments? Well, most of us are probably taught not to. So there's a... There's probably a 20 item kind of thing in the book where I call, where I outline compliment blockers. <laughs> so I talk about uh, the kinds of things that we tend to think or are told and, and, and that's so we shut them down. We don't take them in. And, but I think that that's a high cost to somebody and it's even higher cost when somebody's partially self-critical or engaged in a lot of negative self-talk and that they don't take in compliments because now there's no good, there's no good coming in at all. Interesting. So I'm guessing this could really reshape someone's life. You think of all the key, you know, um, events, someone makes a decision around often it relates to confidence. Should I do this with my life? Should I study this? Should I give this a go? Should I try and create this business or should I express myself with art or whatever it is? Right. It seems like confidence is this like, gate that you, we must pass through to achieve often what we want to achieve out of life. So true, I'm, true. And what I would probably do if I was working with somebody is actually switch the order of the words. Right. It's not a, it's not a, you're using the word should. Um, but I, I talk about in the anxiety chapter, I talk about what I call the, am I, will I, can I do I questions? Yeah. Am I going to be able to do that? 
can I really pull this off, right? Um, and, and for me, all those questions do is foster doubt. So if we flip the order, then we can actually make a statement and feel the difference of the confidence. Oh, I am capable of doing that. I can pull this off. So change the change the question and, and move yourself away from fostering doubt into making the statement and actually allowing yourself to feel more empowered. So it is I'm going to take the risk. And, right. and again, it's not the it's not the risk we're afraid of. It's the emotional outcome of taking the risk that people pull back from. Mm. It's not the risk itself. Do you have any examples from your practice of people that you've processed the, uh, these steps through um, and have gotten someone more confident and the impact that it's made in their health or life? Um, sure. And, and it's, you know, I mean, I, I have a little story. I don't know what the, I don't know what the exact outcome of it is. Um, but a friend of mine gave my books out to his family for Christmas last year. And I learned a couple months ago that not only was his 10 year old using the book uh, and doing exercises in it, his 17 year old was using it with a friend of hers that was depressed. Wow. And, and, but, but if I give a client example uh, of a client that was trying to make a decision about um, somebody she was dating. And do I, do I, you know, stay with this guy? Do I not stay with this guy? Of course, I can't give her exact advice on that. But I also know that she wasn't speaking up and saying the things that she needed to say fully in the relationship. And what I said to her is that uh, not only would she, if she didn't speak up, she would never know. But if she did speak up, she would get a better sense of whether it was something she wanted to lean more into or move away from. And, and so she finally started to do that and not only gained the clarity on which way she wanted to go with the relationship, but she could feel the difference inside herself. It's astounding the difference that when somebody moves from not speaking to speaking, um, it, we talk, I, there might be a massive leap from I'm now, I'm now dealing with my unpleasant feelings and there's this massive leap to here. I will tell you that the leap that speaking up gives is, is not just from here. It's just like, it's quantum. It's massive. It's exponential. So if people want to really change their lives, just doing those two things will elicit a, a massively different experience within themselves. Mm, I can testify to that 100%. I'm sure you're thinking the same thing, right? Uh, I used to be a chronic non-speaker. Like everything you're saying about this typical person, it's it, it was me. 100%. When we had issues, we've been together for 14 years. So mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, early on. We never have issues, babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we'd have issues and we'd call them chats, so like we need to have a chat, which yep. was like we have issues with our relationship. Um, we Matt would has never had an issue with speaking. He would just literally monologue and then it would flip to me and I just could not speak. There would be like like – minutes and minutes and minutes of silence and I'm just saying all these things in my head and I just right, couldn't get right. them out of my mouth right. and so um your framework today Dr. Joan has been so helpful to understand why that was the case and how when I just started to just jump off that ledge and just say the things everything in my life started to follow it's so interesting and from being a musician um I never wanted to perform even though I love music but it wasn't until I just started getting rusted on all the time just like you're performing here, you're performing here, you're performing here. I just had to do it and the confidence followed. So, right, exactly. Um, it's the doing, mm, right, right. Yeah. So, so speaking and doing are two of the important elements. Yep. I'd love to hear your perspective on even, uh, I guess, um, you're saying like, you know, to just focus, um, you know, after we're going through your steps, does our posture or even body language impact that? I'm super fascinated watching like, say, a sprinter, win a race, which is a very open body language and a power stance versus someone that's anxious, has got their arms crossed, their shoulders are in on themselves. Sure. What's happening here? You know, I'm not, I'm not the expert in body language, but, but yes, certainly when, when, we're, when we're kind of crouched in, we're, we're living into the experience of that anxious state. But we're also, if you think about the positioning, we're also closing ourselves off, right? 
So, so phys- it, the, think of the, as I said earlier, the body is the brain. So if I'm doing this with my body, that's what's happening in my brain. And if I'm the sprinter that's willing to kind of go out there and, and just kind of go for it, right, then that open body position is saying that's where my brain is. So the body is simply, it's the non, it's the subconscious reflection of the brain. We're not separate. It's just simply the, the, the positional representation of what's happening here, the spatial representation of what's happening here. And so, yes, the body, the body is, the body simply reflects this. And if we work with the body, we can impact the brain. Super so cool, it man. goes both directions. So if I'm willing to start, I catch myself like this, and I'm willing to start going like this, then I'm going to evoke a different state of mind because I'm living physically differently. There was a woman that came into my practice, and it's big, I had this big, big enough couch this way, and she would go right into the middle, and then she'd kind of end up kind of going like this. Oh, wow. And just kind of, she'd sink into the middle and kind of let herself crouch. And she was talking about feeling disempowered. (laughs) It was like, it's like you're doing it right in front of me. Mm. Now I tend to be pretty direct as you may well have now experienced. (laughs) Um, But it's all coming from a place of love um, that, so I looked at her, I said, you're talking about this and please take a look at what you're doing with your body. You're, you're basically kind of not only talking about it, but you're activating that state continuously. Can we make an agreement that when you are here, that at least you, you make an effort to kind of be in a different positional state? Made a huge difference. Thank you so much, Dr. Joan. For our listeners at home, is there any other tools that we should be aware of that someone's like, okay, I... I really want to implement these confidence boosting techniques. Um, is there anything else that we should be aware of? Um, any other tools? Uh, uh, tools? Uh, well, the the one, the last two have to do with the comp- taking in compliments and stopping oh, yes. the silliness of harsh self criticism. Mm. So, so, talk uh, us. Can you talk us through the harsh self criticism? Where does that come from, and how can we stop that voice? Uh, you make a decision to stop the voice. <laughs> That's how you stop it? Um, do you catch yourself doing it? Um, it's the way I think about it, and I'll give you an example for this. And uh, I think of uh, in the same way that I think of anxiety as a cover for eight unpleasant feelings. I think of harsh self criticism as a distraction from the eight unpleasant feelings, and it's a thought hijack of those unpleasant feelings. So the best way to give you an example of that is I was doing an interview somewhat like this. And the person on the other end, uh, he couldn't hear me, but I could hear him. And and, I, and now he's starting to fumble, and it's going a few minutes into trying to figure out where the problem is that he can't. He just can't find the source of getting it, the thing plugged in, so now he can hear me. And and I'm chilling. It's like I'm cool. It's all right. It's it is whatever it is. There's no judgment on my end. And then what I hear come out of his mouth was. I'm so embarrassed. And without missing a beat, it went into, I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. Now, just that quick, the thought hijack of embarrassment was to criticize himself. So the thing that I would encourage people to understand is anytime you're engaging in harsh self-criticism, you're probably experiencing some kind of unpleasant feeling that you don't want to experience. So like use the fact that you're the fact of your awareness about that to kind of look backwards and look in reverse and go, all right, what was I feeling a moment ago that was harder for me to know or bear and go back to that so that you can get the learning from the sadness or the embarrassment or the anger or whatever it is without judgment about it. Mm. I love that. I, I'm now look. You think you can think of things like alcohol as the why something like alcohol is so interwoven into culture, and you can see it from what we, we've just learned today on the call. When you so expertly taught us about vulnerability, 
um, and these emotional states, it's sort of like alcohol is that shortcut away from these. It's yep. like, I can't talk about my true emotions mm-hmm. until I'm drunk, or um, right. I can't do this speech at this wedding until I've had like five right. drinks. Right, right. And, and it's it, all, and, right. It, it's such a destructive cycle when we're depending on substances to, to encounter these vulnerable states. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yes. And, and I, my thing is, and I, I drew it, I actually drew, drew a diagram many, many years ago and I make reference to it in the book. It doesn't show up anywhere yet, but the, uh, the truth is we can go down a pathway uh, that I call soulful depression or this pathway of, if you will, this soulful aliveness the, and a sense of aliveness, confidence, etc. cetera. Uh, but the first thing that's on that sheet is trying not to know what we know. And we do that through a variety of distractions and a variety of ways to disconnect. Alcohol and other drugs are certainly the first step in taking us to soulful depression. So, so, so yes, it's, uh, that's exactly why someone is doing it. It's to move away from the experience that feels too uncomfortable. Sure. Well, I really hope that, and I, I know we certainly have got so much out of this, and I hope that anyone listening maybe doesn't have to reach for the drink for that confidence boost. Agreed. That we've, they're empowered to change their life um, and to, within 90 seconds, get a hold <laughs> of these emotions um, and, right and then, you know, the start doing the reps to build their confidence, which I think I wouldn't, I'd highly recommend, obviously, getting. Um, so you have two books. Would you like to just tell us a little bit more where people can get those books? And well, how the, they can learn more about the first you? one, the first one is, uh, is easier anxiety. It was, it came out probably, uh, five or six years ago. Uh, and a, much of what's in that book is actually contained in the 90 seconds book. Uh, and the 90 seconds book really kind of covers the whole, I make reference to unpleasant feelings in the easier anxiety book, but the, it's like, it came out with the whole thing, uh, in the 90 seconds book. So my encouragement, uh, you're what people are welcome to get the easier anxiety. My thing is, it's really the 90 seconds book that's going to literally walk you from the front end to the to the back end. So wonderful! Oh, I wish I met you years ago, Dr. Joan. And you I have hope- me now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all these Permanent. tools in my toolbox we'll now. We're dropping voicemails all the time. Um, <laughs> I, I'm in, <laughs> Dr. Joan. I feel embarrassed. Help me. I'll be leaving you a voicemail. <laughs> um, uh, so for everyone listening, definitely get a copy of Dr. Joan's book. If you love the content today, um, I know that we did. Uh, you can grab that at drjoanrosenberg.com or on, is it on Amazon as well? Oh my God, yes. It's on Amazon okay. or wherever Everywhere. you get books. So it's 90 Perfect. seconds to a life you love. Wonderful. Yeah. And just asking for a friend, do you <laughs> yeah. take any clients? I do. Yes. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Awesome. Yes. Yes. So if you want to go deeper one-on-one, um, I, I would highly recommend I do, I, that. I, I, I do consulting, yes. Yeah. Awesome. And and also um, carry it to other kind of experiences where speaking or consulting or that sort of thing as well. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for today, Dr. Joan. It's been a very helpful session and I can't believe that how little it's spoken about actually. So thank you for doing this work. I think it's really needed and really helpful. So Thank you again for joining us. You bet. Thank you. Quite grateful to be here. Thanks. So what did you think? Do you think it's possible to get more confidence in 90 seconds? I'd love to hear your thoughts below what you've done to increase confidence or if you resonated with any certain tool or protocol that Dr. Jones spoke about. But I know that a lot of you who are watching today and not subscribed to the channel, so it would mean a lot to us and it would help us a lot if you could hit like, hit subscribe uh, below. And even if you're like a top top shelf student, uh, hit the notification bell as well. And we also wanted to let you know that our goodnesslover.com supplement store is now open. So if you would like to support us and get your hands on some really great quality supplements, that's a place to go. You can see the link in the show notes below, but otherwise we'll see you next time and have a confident day. (laughs) 